Exactly, uh, as the Defence Secretary set it out earlier. But let me just make one other point in addition to the points I made a moment or two ago. Conflict, even now, could be avoided in one of two sets of circumstances. Either Saddam fully and unconditionally complies, and let's just spell out what that means. It means accounting for the thousands of litres of anthrax that he had. It means accounting for the hundreds of tonnes of precursor chemicals. It means accounting for the thousands of special munitions for chemical and biological warfare. It means accounting for the one and a half tonnes of VX nerve agent. It means giving proper access to the interviews for Iraqi scientists and experts. And let me just tell the House that there have been 34 requests for such interviews refused, that the only requests, nine of them that have been granted, have been granted on Iraqi terms, not the terms set out by the inspectors. So he has to comply fully and absolutely as we set out. That is one alternative. The other alternative is that he leaves. But those are the only two ways of avoiding conflict, but conflict could be avoided by either of those two routes. So to people who say that we are hell-bent on conflict, we still say today it can be avoided if he does what the United Nations and the international community demand that he do. We'll make its uh, decision shortly, and I understand, obviously, it is important to recognise, as my honourable friend has indicated, that people in London are fully behind the bid. Mr. Speaker, when, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, when the Prime Minister says that he hopes that there would be a vote at the United Nations on a second resolution, is he implying by that that if, for whatever reasons, there is not a vote on a second resolution, Britain will still go in with the United States and military action on Iraq will follow? Ah, yes. No, I'm simply saying that obviously it depends on the compliance of Saddam, but if he is not complying, there will undoubtedly be a resolution put to a vote. Speaker, can the Prime Minister also clarify the remarks that he made in his comments in the House last week? Can we have a guarantee that before any military action involving British troops is taken, there will be an opportunity for a debate, a debate and a definitive vote in this House? Yeah. The Foreign Secretary spelt that out very, very clearly in the course of the debate and said, subject to the caveat we've always put down about the security of troops, that a decision should be put to the House, and I accept that. But in the end, with the greatest respect to the right honourable gentleman, it's not a matter of process or procedure, important though that is. It is a question of whether he, as well as we, are prepared to uphold the resolution 1441 that everyone said we should uphold. And I simply put to him this, because I've spoken to many world leaders over the last few days and discussed this issue with them. There is not a single leader that I have spoken to, or official of any government, that disputes the fact that Saddam is not presently complying. Everyone accepts he isn't. Everyone accepts that he is not properly cooperating. Everybody accepts that he is a threat. Now, Resolution 1441 said he had a final opportunity to disarm voluntarily, and he had to cooperate fully, unconditionally, immediately. Everybody accepts that he is not doing so. Surely he should be joining me in urging people to vote for that second resolution. In accordance with international law. Secondly, in relation to the resolution, we are confident of securing the votes for that resolution. And we will carry on working to that end. And the reason we are doing that is because we believe it is important that the UN, having declared a position on Iraq, then follows through and maintains that position. And the one thing I, I would say to her, because I know she, she obviously opposes our, our position on this, and I, I don't disrespect that, she's perfectly entitled to. But the one thing I would say to her is that I know we both agree that the authority of the UN is important. But if the authority of the UN is to be upheld, it's important that what we said last November is actually implemented. If it isn't, if it isn't, then the effect on the UN, quite apart from the effect on the international situation, the effect on the UN would be disastrous. Yeah. Since 1980, the United States of America have vetoed 14 resolutions of the Security Council on the Middle East. Does he consider these vetoes to be reasonable or unreasonable? Yeah. I would simply point out to that the UN resolutions are not just in respect of Israel, they're also in respect of the Arab world and the Palestinians too. And in relation to the Palestinian territories, I think what is happening there is an appalling situation. But the only way out of it, in order to maintain 
all the UN resolutions, not just those on Israel, but those on the Palestinians and the, and the Arab world. The only way out of this is to get a peace process going again in the Middle East. And all I can say to it is that this country will play its full part in that. But in the end, the, the only way of avoiding the terrible tragedy, there are all sorts of people that may have made statements about this, but let me tell them what is actually happening. What is happening at the present time is that we are in intensive discussions, not just with the United States, but with others. Indeed, a part of my discussion with the Russian foreign minister was about this this morning, about how we make sure that if there is a conflict, that in a post-conflict situation, we take the greatest care of the humanitarian situation in Iraq. And for that, I've got no doubt at all, there has to be a substantial United Nations involvement. Now, that is what we are arguing for and what we want to see. And I believe that will be the outcome. And so I think rather than speculate on what might happen, I can assure my honourable friend, the moment we have those plans properly worked out, we will declare them to people. He's right to, to, uh, to ask that question because people do ask it. I think the threat is twofold. The threat of leaving Saddam Hussein armed with weapons of mass destruction the threat is either that he begins another conflict in his region into which we would inevitably be sucked as a country with all that means, or alternatively, and I think this is a powerful developing threat that the world must face, that the combination of states like Iraq, who are proliferating these chemical and biological um, weapons of mass destruction, and terrorists who are desperate to get their hands on them, to wreak maximum destruction, that those two things come together in a devastating way for the world. And I simply say to people, that, that the 11th of September, of course, changed many American minds as to the threat, but it should change everyone's mind in this sense. Surely everyone accepts that had those people been able to cause even more death and destruction, they would have. Now, the worry I have is when you've got nations that are proliferating, trading in this stuff, developing it, and terrorist groups desperate to cause maximum destruction. The world has to stand firm. It's come to a point over Iraq, and if we don't stand firm now over Iraq, we will never be able to deal with the next threat that encompasses us. Yeah.